All right, welcome to uh, Norris Clark's The One and the Many, Chapter 10, The Metaphysical Structures of Finite Being and Interlocking Synthesis. So this is sort of a chapter uh, that sums up uh, more or less everything we've covered up to this point. And uh, so this is a good uh, moment to take stock and review anything that, that um, you know, we feel we need to review. Um, so I'm just going to read out a little bit of this because I think, um, you know, Clark puts it much more succinctly and uh, pithily than I could. Um, so he says, we have now finished the first part of our systematic unfolding of Thomistic metaphysics, what we might call the treatise on the intrinsic metaphysical structure of finite beings. Before moving on, let us look back and take a synoptic view of what we have accomplished. We began with a universe of many real beings. And uh, I, I would probably say that that sort of corresponds to what many people would, you know, think of as, as reality as, as being that sort of like, I guess, a, a, you know, naive realism would say that that's, that's what there is. Um, there's a bunch of things and they're uh, real. And uh, after exploring what is meant by real being and its basic property of self-manifestation and self-communication through action, we uncovered the second equally fundamental property of real being, that every being in order to be at all must be intrinsically one, self-coherent as a single center of presence and a single center of action. We then followed the thread of being presenting itself as both one and many through the various dimensions of being in our universe. The questions raised by this perspective led us to discover the three great metaphysical substructures of all the beings in our experience, essence, existence, matter, form, and substance, accident. These three in endlessly varied combinations are all that is needed to take care of the fundamental intrinsic properties common to all finite and changing beings. Each being that is both finite and changing that is all the ones in our experience will possess throughout its span of existence, one abiding essence existence composition, making it to be a member of the community of existence, one abiding matter form composition, making it to be one member of a species or kind of being and many different substance accident compositions as it undergoes its unique history of change in interaction with the rest of the universe. Matter form in its second role as explanatory structure of essential change is enlisted to render intelligible the more profound changes in the universe where one being breaks down and passes over into a different one entirely. And now we pass to the synthesis. <clears throat> it is important now to bring together all these inner structures to see how they fit together into an interlocking synthesis within the overall abiding unity of each being as a single unified whole. Analysis, the Greek is analuo, to take apart, must always be followed by synthesis, Greek synthesis, to put together. Uh, for none of these compositions or their constituent metaphysical co-principles are complete things or beings on their own, but only substructures within the overarching unity of the whole being. Unity is the beginning and end of all analysis. We begin with a globally grasped, but not yet analyzed and articulated whole. If our analysis has been successful, we end with a clearly analyzed and articulated whole, an understood whole, but still a whole, a unity, that which is. Do we have any uh, questions about that, that preamble? So what do you mean is that there's no infinite regressive genus and species of, or matter in form, there's, there's no infinite regressive definition of a substance like, this is the genus, this is the species, and so on and so forth. Yes, I, I would say so. Just, uh, I had a question but where he says um i suppose i mean when he says that um um existence existence and essence and existence 
Uh, so each being that is both finite and changing will possess throughout its span of existence one abiding essence existence composition, which is which kind of you, you, that makes sense, or you, at least you can accept that, um, uh, making it to be a member of the community of existence. But then he says that um, he uses the same word abiding for the, for the matter form composition. And I, I was thinking, but surely if you think of a thing or a, or a substance, then um, a human, a person, say a human being, then if you lose a limb, then you lose some. So it's not an abiding matter form composition. It doesn't seem to be like a permanent thing or an abiding thing, because surely if you, you know, you lose matter is, is lost all the time and gained. Right. So I was a bit not sure. Maybe he means something different, but didn't get that bit. Um, and then he says, uh, yeah, the different, and then there are different, uh, the accident, substance accident compositions, it says it undergoes, uh, is, is, has, um, there are many different compositions and as it undergoes its unique history of change and interaction with the rest of the universe. That makes sense as well. Too. But the, the middle bit didn't make so much sense. May I add something to what you said? I think I can answer your question. First off, how do you take the term and, as in matter and form, how do you take the term and? But he doesn't say matter, he doesn't use the word and, he just uses a slash, uh, forward slash matter form composition. Um, okay, but so how do you take the slash? Do you take it as union or conjunction? In other words, you can't really separate the two. <laughs> Yeah, it's a comp. He calls it composition. So yeah, he, you can't separate the two, I suppose. Um, except that, I mean, in some sense, you have to separate because you know. I think that Aquinas's view is, you know, there are things like the angels which have form but don't have matter and so on. Yes, so yes, are of course. There are immaterial substances, so matter and form are not completely indissolubly linked together so but they're a composition whatever that means however you want to take that but yeah they're not yeah they're a composition that's the word. that's his word i don't know exactly how to interpret that because but. what i'm saying is that you know how well how can it be a matter in a form composite if you lose some matter because how you said you know if you lose an arm you're losing matter right sure yeah, uh, I mean, that would be the sort of common sense, I suppose, at least prima facie, that seems to be. I mean, so, so when you say have a substance um, or a thing, uh, a human being, then it, it doesn't seem to be, I don't know, it doesn't matter form composition doesn't seem to be something I would describe as uh, abiding, you know, in, throughout its span of existence. So, well, but yeah. Well, there's, it, I mean, if there's, there's some dim you know, even if there's some diminution of, of, of the quantity or, I mean, it's it, it, the, the fundamental fact of the matter form composition isn't, you know, changed by that. Um, you know, we'll, we'll get later to kind of, you know, the, uh, it, it's, it's possible for one thing to change into something else entirely. Um, but but in, in, in this case, I think, uh, you, you know, it's, 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 um, like, 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 like in this case, you know, what, what we're talking about is primary matter, right? Which, which uh, he defines in the glossary as that non-formal principle of quantitative spatial extension that functions as a potency receiving the qualitative perfection of form, limiting, limiting it to this location now in the space-time matrix of the material world. And also serving as the principle of continuity in the transition from one essential form to another in essential change. Um, yeah. That, that is, uh, actually, yeah. Um, did you want to add something? Sorry. Um, that, that was, I found that um, really interesting as well, actually, the notion of um, primary matter, because I was a bit confused about what exactly primary matter was um, last week. So, and I read something else, um, uh, another book I referred to, um, is this book on Aquinas, and he talks about prime, prime matter, and it's a bit different, actually. Maybe we'll come back to that later. So he has a different, 
well. I mean, it's 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 not exactly the same definition, but maybe we'll come back to that and because it it raises um, some interesting questions. So definitely, I'm looking looking forward to to getting into that. We'll just we'll just yeah. uh, press through a little bit and then we'll sort of be yeah. able to enter yeah. into the particular. Um, all right, so you know, he looks first at static structures, right, and then at dynamic structures of being. Um, so, in terms of static structures, right, the first and most basic is essence existence, right, and uh, uh, you know th that is uh, foundational for all the rest. Um, so it's it's through that essence uh, e existence. Um, I don't know if fusion is is the is the correct word, um, if we recall, because they're they're not they're not two separate things already. They're 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 two two aspects of, of a single thing, um, neither of which could be by itself. You, you know, it's not glued together, but kind of uh, you know within within the thing, uh, making making it up, constituting it. Um, so uh, you know, the act of actual existence is the all-inclusive source of perfection, of active presence, and then the the essence, right, is the uh, the limiting mode or degree that makes it that particular uh, thing, and and not some other thing. Um, and and so it's because there's that you know that existence is sort of is why things are one, and then and then the manyness comes from these uh, determining uh, essences. And he, he clarifies, though, it's, it's not just the specific essence making it to be this kind of being, but uh, the whole individual essence containing everything that makes it distinct from other beings, including uh, both matter and form, if both are needed. And he uses this, um, this analogy, right? The essence is like the restrictive channel along which flows and expresses itself the encapsulated energy of the act of existence. And uh, so he says, every finite being is a channeled bundle of energy, the energy of existence. And then uh, this new composition, right, the form matter is nested within essence existence. Um, and it's within the essence component, right? For, so form matter is within, is within essence in the essence existence um, composition. Um, and that's why, you know, he says, uh, you know, how is it that many different things can be similar, right? Uh, not only, you know, in, insofar as they exist, right? But also in the sense that, you know, they, they can share uh, the same specific essence or, or kind of being, right? They can be members of the same species, um, sharing equally in the same qualitative essential form. Um, and, and so, um, You know, right, uh, pr what primary matter does, he says, right, is that it, it allows many different individuals to share or reproduce the same form uh, without essential qualitative difference. Um, so primary matter, right, is, is a principle of quantitative spatial extension, uh, which allows a reproduction in different parts of this sort of, you know, spread out stuff, uh, right? But, but there's no qualitative or formal differentiation. So there can be um, right equal ontological value um, of 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 distinct beings that are that are in a a group sort of you know as as equals you know at which you know can be uh, in he uh, it's interesting that he he says that that this isn't possible in societies of purely spiritual beings and you know it'd be interesting to talk about I'm I'm sort of I had a little difficulty understanding precisely why that is the case. Um, and it, it, I'm sure it's related to that question of, of, you know, each angel being as a purely spiritual being, being its own species. Um, so then he, he, you know, the basic theme, right, is that of participation, um, right? And, uh, right, so, right, that, so essence functioned as a limited mode of participation in the fullness of existence. Okay, and then matter functions as a, a limiting principle for the qualitative perfection of essential form, pinning the latter down to the present here and now only, and not anywhere else in the space-time matrix. Um, so, 
Right. So a purely spiritual being, he says, right, which has no material body. Uh, and I've always been in, intrigued by this, uh, you know, because this would be sort of the angelic mode of being or, you know, it, it, it sort of can be wherever it wishes to be. It's not it's not limited um, spatially. Um, which is why um, the question, right, angels on a head of a pin, you, the answer could be uh, an in, infinite angels on the head of a pin, or, or you could say maybe that, that's just a kind of a, uh, a logical error be, be, because uh, they don't occupy any, any space at all. Um, and so, uh, right, but when it's, when, it's, when it's bonded to matter, shall we say, um, right, that then, then there's a unique history different from every other, right? And, and when, when that, uh, you know, form is, is bonded to matter, then um, there are increasing accidental qualitative differences, right? As that being responds individually to interactions with other individual beings, right? And then this, this generates history in kind of the space-time extended uh, material universe. Um, is, is, is that, um, was that fairly clear or were there any points that were ambiguous to anyone? And we can, we can revisit um, if need be, uh, right? So then he gets into uh, participation on the vertical and horizontal dimensions. Um, so essence, existence, composition, right? That's participation on the vertical or up and down scale of being, right? Which, uh, you know, so that we then have a hierarchy of beings, right? Uh, from ho higher to lower in qualitative perfection. Um, so the principle of essential form inside the essence is what makes it possible. If you change uh, the essential form, right, you change the qualitative level of perfection of that being, right? Uh, however, and, and again, right, the, the form matter composition then allows, you know, horizontal um, participation, uh, right? Be, because they can all have that same level degree of qualitative perfection, but then uh, multiplied on the quantitative level and, and the qualitative degree of perfection just, you know, is the same, but then they kind of um, share in an equal ontological value and dignity. So he uses the example of the uh, Declaration of Independence, right? Uh, all men are by nature created equal, you know? So that's an example of kind of sharing the same qualitative degree of perfection while, you know, quantitatively, horizontally, there's, there's a differentiation. Um, and I think it's very important to, you know, he, you know, form, right, has a special middle status in the trio of existence, form, matter. So form looks up to existence, right? So, and, and, and as it does that, uh, it's a limiting principle on what's above it, right? So form is a limitation of exist vis-a-vis -vis existence, but then looking down at matter, right, then matter is, is, is what limits uh, form. Um, so uh, now, and this is, this is, I think, debatable, but, you know, we can get into that later. But uh, according to uh, Clark and, you know, according to existential Thomists in general, you, they, they would assert, uh, right, that only St. Thomas uh, was the one who really pushed deeper than the form matter composition to get to the essence existence one, right? So it's kind of this idea that, um, you know, Thomas's existentialism was in some way just a very um, original uh, revelation of, of the character of being. Um, right, and this is where he says, so if, if all multiplication of the same essential form among more than one member of a species requires a composition of matter and form, uh, then it follows that among beings that do not possess matter, but only purely qualitative essences, that is pure forms, there can only be one member of each species. 
Um, so each form exhausts the perfection of its own species. Um, and uh, matter, you know, since matter does not limit or restrict the concentrated fullness of perfection and action of its form, the only essential differences it could have from other beings would be qualitative ones, right? Which would immediately change it to be uh, an essentially different species, right? So, right, uh, the angel Gabriel is Gabrielity, <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, no man exhausts humanity. And he would even say, not even Christ, not even Christ, the God man as man. Um, he says, the only fullness of Christ as man will come from the final beatitude of the whole human race with Christ as its head. That sounds pretty good to me. Um, and uh, we can uh, get into that as well. All right, so that's, that's all static. Um, and then we'll, we'll get into dynamic. Um, all right, so... The general structure of any changing being right and and that would describe all of the beings that that we know in our experience you know every, it, it, we we perceive that there is a a continuity and a change in 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 all of the you know the the beings that were presently you know apprehending and that we can recall and that we anticipate you know there's always both uh, continuity and change right and we he calls it a synthesis of permanence and process. Um, and he says the general type of relationship of these two co-principles is that of an actuality or an act uh, to a potentiality or a potency, right? So uh, a principle, let's see, a principle that has an intrinsic aptitude or natural capacity to receive a spectrum of possible actualities within certain overall limits that define its nature. Um, so he says, if you ask, what is the nature of this being, then the response would be, uh, what can it do or become? Um, so then as soon as a being has exhausted the entire spectrum of its possible actualizations, its history of change is over. Um, and then he's, you know, so then he says there are two types of change, right? There's accidental change, and essential change, and accident, and ju just to just to kind of, uh, you know, preemptively write write write. Um, essence, nature, and substance are all talking about the same thing, but in in different, um, right? Because because like, essence is that which makes a being to be what it is, right? This particular being distinct from every other. Substance is that same essence. Uh, but considered as an abiding center of action uh, from which flow, you know, the being's characteristic actions. And then when we call it substance, right, substance is, you know, that same essence, right, but we're, but then we're considering it as um, what renders a being uh, apt to exist in itself and not in another. So kind of, uh, right, a as itself, not, not as part of some other being. Um, and so it's it, a substance is that the being's principle of unity, kind of holding together its accidental attributes. Um, so self-identity amid accidental changes across time. <clears throat> right, and when he talks about accidental change, uh, Right, this, the substance principle here, he says, notice this is not a static thing by itself, but a dynamic principle of flexible, flexible self-identity, right? Which does itself change uh, throughout a series of non-essential changes, but only accidentally, not substantially or essentially, right? So it's, it's um, through a history of interactions with the beings in its surrounding world or environment, right? Uh, that self-identity persists. Um, once the impact of these other beings or of destructive forces within it becomes so powerful that it can no longer be actively assimilated into the being's own intrinsic unity, then the substance loses control of its own being, 
uh, collapses as a being on its own and turns into some other being or beings uh, in a substantial change. Uh, the substance is identical in being though not in name because of its particular function with the whole form matter essence that is composed with the act of existence. Um, so substance plays two roles, he says, right? It's a principle of simultaneous unity, holding together all the non-essential attributes that a being possesses at any one time. It's the one possessing the many. And substance is that enduring self-identity or unity across time. Um, so the one perduring through the many, right? Possessing the many and, you know, perduring, or I guess you kind of continuing persistent, you know. <clears throat> and then the other kind of change, right, is, is that uh, essential change, right? Um, where a being is broken down and becomes another being entirely, right? It's, it's no longer... Uh, maintaining itself as what it was, but it, it transforms. Um, and that requires a new structure of act and potency for us to understand it, right? For it to become intelligible um, to our inquiry. So um, here the acts that replace each other are the essential form of the old being and the essential form of the new being. Um, and as Clark points out, uh, you know, th there can only be one fully autonomous operating essential form at any time in one essence. Um, so what that means is that um, what passes over as the principle of continuity must be a non-formal principle, right? Um, it, it can't be, um, right, because, uh, yeah. Uh, so that's where primary matter comes in, right? Um, like primary matter, right, in its nature is plastic, uh, you know, mutable, determinable, um, with the radical potentiality to be taken over by a higher form, right, to make up the unity of a higher essence. So, yeah, so, so there's one positive non-formal property of matter, which is its quantitative extension in space. Uh, so this is interesting because the same principle of matter that earlier was different in each composition of form and matter now becomes that which remains the same uh, throughout the change from one essential form to another. So here the one many relation is reversed uh, when there is an essential change, when one thing just becomes another thing entirely. Um, there's, there's, um, which I think is, uh, a crucial point to grasp. Um, <clears throat> do we have Do we have any uh, questions about about that so far? Again, we will uh, hopefully return to that in the the general discussion. So, what he's saying then is right. So, we've got the static. Um, dimension of being and we've got the dynamic dimension of being. And he says we need we need to synthesize all the compositions and we do that under act and potency. <clears throat> and, and this really is like uh, what distinguishes the Thomistic metaphysical system and uh, now I, I would just want to ask you know and you know it's it's sort of secondary to, um, you know, the actual, um, you know, the ha how it works, it's secondary to how it works, but I, I would question whether in fact, you know, we'd say it's distinctive of Thomas, but I would say Avicenna does something very, very much like this. Um, you know, they're very, they're very close to each other. Um, so, right, the, this synthesis, right, of act and potency is not strictly needed in order to understand why each of these compositions is necessary or how it works but it does add a certain splendor of harmony, right? I like splendor, you know, beauty is the splendor of truth, right? That splendor of harmony and a more tightly interlocking unity that delights and gives deeper intellectual satisfaction to the mind um, 
it's also the expression of St. Thomas's peculiar genius, right? So he's, he's synthesized um, Platonic, the sort of Platonic, Neoplatonic metaphysical stream with the Aristotelian. Um, and this is where, you know, Clark gives sort of a historical account, right, of, of kind of the development of classical metaphysics. So, right, Aristotle sets down act in potency in order to explain, uh, you know, change, essentially, right, and, and uh, which Plato excluded change from the realm of true and certain knowledge, right, you know, the, the realm of divine ideas is uh, unchanging. Um, but um, the thing is that for Aristotle, uh, potency is only a capacity of change. It's not a uh, limitation in a participation structure of the universe, which according to Clark, at least, Aristotle rejected that as being too Platonic. So basically he's going to say, you know, Aristotle uh, doesn't have uh, a participatory metaphysics. Um, right, there's no room for an essence existence composition where form uh, is a limited participation in the higher ultimate unlimited fullness of existence, which, you know, is God. Uh, form for Aristotle is the ultimate principle of perfection in the universe, while existence is simply taken for granted and given no explicit place uh, within Aristotle's metaphysical system, uh, right? And, and why? Uh, well, Aristotle saw the universe as beginningless and endless, right? And the prime mover, Aristotle's God, um, is only the source of the cycles of motion of the universe, right? He kind of, uh, right, because uh, they're, they're, they're drawn to the prime mover and, and it kind of, it, 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 sets, it sets everything in motion, but it's not the source of, it's not the ground of being. Aristotle's God is not the ground of being. Um, and then because the world just is eternally, right? There's, there's no uh, given or possible explanation, you know, for how does the world come about? It just, it, it is. Um, so then, uh, right, form, uh, right, is, is that which limits the indeterminacy, the unfinished, chaotic, and disordered character of matter and, and potency, right, making it into order, beauty, and perfection, right, so, like, um, he, he's saying that for the Greeks of that era, right, perfection is limitation, right, finished, finite, formed, right, they, they don't like, uh, you know, like, in, infinite, right, uh, non-defined, and so that's imperfect, right, uh, unlimited, unfinished, you know, formless, right? So matter and potency are, are the things that are, are not uh, formed in that way. So, it, so uh, Aristotle says, nature flees the infinite as the unfinished, right? So then where do we get a more positive, uh, you know, aside from sort of the uh, Abrahamic tradition, where do we get this sense that that the infinite is is actually um, good, you know, and 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 beautiful, and you know, sort of sort of um, well, we we get it with um, the Neoplatonists, right? And he uses Plotinus as the example, right? Um, and Plotinus uh, puts forward the one and the good. One and good are the same. The same principle. Right, which is beyond the realm of distinct, determinable, uh, finite Platonic ideas. And the one is also beyond the uh, Aristotelian forms, right? Utterly simple, infinite, concentrated fullness of perfection beyond all limitation, right? Even of intelligible form. So then the whole universe flows out, right? By necessary emanation from the one in successive descending levels. Um, and each level of, of the uh, procession of being participates, right, uh, in the perfection that is above it, right, according to its own mode. Um, so then uh, if we look at what then does that do? So that the whole universe is a vast hierarchy of descending levels of limited participation in the ultimate unlimited fullness of the one or of the good. 
Mm-hmm. Right? The infinite is the ultimate perfection. Well, finitude is now on the side of imperfection. And uh, then, so the Greek fathers, you know, uh, take up this perspective, right? Um, right. So, so they adapt it, right? Sort of the Christian vision of creation, right? Where God becomes the infinite source of all being. Uh, and all creatures are finite participation participations in infinite fullness. Um, and so Aquinas, right, has the same basic vision, but um, for Aquinas, uh, you know, at, at least on Clark's reading, and, and we can challenge this, you know, whether this is a, a fair reading of the Neoplatonists or not. Um, but according to Clark, right, Aquinas uh, detects uh, an unresolved duality between the good and existence, right? To be the ultimate reality and the source of all that is, uh, the good itself would have to actually exist, right? It would have to possess actual existence more fully than everything else. But the thing is that Plotinus doesn't say that the one exists, right? Because, um, you know, that would mean there's composition in the good, right? It would be the good plus existence, right? And then it would no longer be utterly simple, the utterly simple one beyond being, right? So, so that would compromise the priority of the good. Um, so according to uh, Clark, uh, Aquinas turns this priority upside down, right? So instead of, you know, the one beyond being, being supreme, then the supreme actually is ipsum esse, being itself, right? Or existence. Um, and, and the good is a primary but subordinate attribute expressing the very nature of being itself. Um, so still very exalted, right? The, the good is very exalted, but it's really uh, existence that is supreme. Um, right? And that existence, right, is a, a pure existence beyond any limiting essence. Uh, Right, so it's like the, the general structure of Neoplatonic participation is taken over by Aquinas as a technical conceptual tool. And then into that, right, uh, Aquinas pours uh, what for Clark is Aquinas's original metaphysical vision of existence itself as the ultimate core of all perfection, right? Shared with all creatures by multiple modes of participation through diverse limiting essences. And so, Right. He's gone beyond Aristotle, who rejected participation, at least on this reading. Um, you know, which which was which was uh, Aristotle's difference from a more Platonic perspective, and also, um, you know, that this this is that this is a shift. You know, it, it differs from Platonic and Neoplatonic metaphysics. Um, Clark wants to say that that Platonism is anti-matter, um, which which is again something that we can uh, nuance a little bit. I think um, so. He uses the Aristotelian doctrine of act and potency, right, to subsume this uh, participatory metaphysics, um, right. And so, act and potency in Aquinas are no longer just what they were in Aristotle, which was you know a way of accounting. Uh, for change, um, potency for Aquinas is redefined as any principle that receives and limits an actual perfection to some finite mode, whether this is a structure of change or not. So this is now the theorem that expresses, you know, the relationship of potency to act. Act is not limited, save by reception into some distinct limiting potency. Right, so, so pure act, actus purus, is um, by nature unlimited, right? Uh, and we see this in the pure act of essay in God, right? Uh, you know, pure, pure actuality, uh, right? Um, and it, it leads to a very kind of uh, beautifully uh, harmonious and, and, um, kind of symmetrical vision because um, act and po- act potency structure, right? Beyond the realm of change, um, 
the three Thomistic metaphysical compositions fit into this very, very, very nicely. Um, essence, existence, uh, matter, form, and substance, accident. Um, Hmm. Thus, essence is to the act of existence as limiting potency to act in the order of qualitative perfection. And these are a series of analogies. Matter is to form as another mode of potency, limiting the actuality of form by pinning it down to here and not there in the quantitative order of spatial extension, right? But but not, not changing the, you know, the the qualitative aspect remains the same, but but there's this quantitative um, differentiation extension as as uh, particular beings on the same uh, degree of being, um, and it serves matter also though serves right and you right see that right matter serves as the principle of continuity for the transition from one essential form to another, um, right so it's like. Uh, there are outside limits to possible change uh, of a being, which are very wide. But if it exceeds those, then it's it's no longer the same being cha that's that's changed in some way. But but it's it's another being altogether. Um, and then substance is uh, to accident right as a receptive and limiting potency to the whole range of accidental perfections open to successive participation by this particular kind of being, right? So it's like, it gives us this vision of the whole universe as uh, endlessly different proportions, or he uses the, the term uh, dosages of act and potency, right? It's like, you've just kind of, you know, uh, so all the way from pure act, like the, the pinnacle is pure act unmixed with potency at the very highest level of being, right? Down through, as he puts it, a vast symphony of variations on the basic theme of act and potency. Uh, so there are all these different modes and this is this is what the universe is, right? It's these different modes of limited participation in the actuality of perfection, which, you know, ultimately is existence itself, ipsum esse, subsistence, uh, by different modes and degrees of potentiality. So it, it extends all the way down to the lowest degree of actuality possible, but, right? Uh, there's no there's no pure potency with no actuality at all, right? Because if there were pure uh, potency or potentiality, right, rooted in no actuality, then then that would just be nothingness. It it wouldn't be on the scale of being. It would, you know, we 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 can't. Uh, it it's no longer part of the community of real beings. Um, so pure act can, can exist. If I could interject yes. in there, I feel Please. like that insight. I mentioned it earlier in this chapter. I think that insight was something that would have been good for me to bring up last time. But I, uh, when we were talking about the difficulty of trying to understand what prime matter is, I mean, we're talking about it being like absolute openness to you know different ways of existing. But like strictly speaking, it's impossible for it to be out there because the only way for you to exist uh, is to exist in a certain way. Uh, and that just means that you have to have some direction that you're going in existence. And that just means that at the most bottom level of existence, like there's still some like form to it that like constrains how it exists and, and all that. So really when we're talking about like heading toward prime matter, we are talking about like uh, to some extent, like lacking being to go to like that, that edge of having absolutely no difference from anything else, nothing conceptually available, nothing intelligible. It's just non being. Uh, I, I, I think like, um, it's just in general helpful to think that like, if anything exists, it exists a certain way. And that way that it exists is just what we're trying to capture with essences and forms and other stuff. And so if we're talking about like prime matter, uh, like without any form, we're, we're talking about something that has no actuality. And so as you were just putting it and as he put it, like it's just helpful to kind of like think about if we're trying to understand what matter is 
absent any form, any way of existing. We're just talking about something that doesn't exist. Right, and that, that, that's great. Just, Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, just to add one, um, not with any objection, but just to say that that raises the question, Jonathan, you know, if, as, you, as you said, it's the case that um, for something to, uh, to exist, it has to exist in a certain way, you know, it has to exist as a form, in other words. Um, should we say that God exists? <laughs> if God is not a form, yeah. God I was, I was thinking about way. that. I was thinking about that earlier today for exactly that point. Yeah. Uh, to say like God is like all, the fullness of all the ways uh, is, is what we mean by a pure act, right? Like all expressions of being are in one uh, single act of existence. Uh, that, that is God, right? Or, or should we think of it uh, differently? Um, I think that's one way of thinking of it. Um, another way is obviously, you know, the Neoplatonist way of God is beyond being or huperousios in Greek, right? Uh, yeah, that's a good um, point. I, I think, yeah, these ways can complement each other. But um, yeah, I guess it just depends um, what you <laughs> prefer and what um, imagery, because yeah, in some ways you can say that if, if just if for something to exist means to exist in a certain way to stand outside, you know, as a distinct discrete entity, whatever. You could say, according to, to Aquinas's logic, that God doesn't exist in this sense of exist, but that would be misleading to most people, obviously, because you don't want to say, yeah, God doesn't exist. Exactly, God which is, means that we have yeah. to invoke some like non-univocal notion of existing. Yeah, which uh, is itself really quite controversial. I mean, yeah, it's yeah, it's hard for people people to to, correct, to grasp whether there's any such thing as a non univocal um, mode of existing. Even but, as somebody um, who affirms like in like analogical uh, right, predication, analogical exactly. existence yeah. for God, yeah, I, yeah uh, it is very difficult to understand. I don't claim to understand it well. Sure, but yeah, anyway, that's just. Question. I think that's an excellent point, though. Like I, I just said, it was like God is pure act. I mean, we're putting him on the, the scale of act potency, but we have to like qualify what we're saying and exactly the concern that you raised. Yeah. So was, uh, like, go, oh, yeah, please. Yeah, sure. No worries. No, no. I was just wanted um, these things about the existence of God and stuff made me think of a joke that, you know, Jacques Lacan, you know, the French uh, psychoanalyst said. He said, he said something like God does not exist, it insists, right? It's almost like this pure potential, unlimited, unconstrained energy that wants to express itself or to give like different constraints and different existence to others. So it insists as a potential. But even if I say that, I show an orientation, I show like something, uh, some kind of uh, a direction or an orientation, and that would be a mode of existence itself. So even that would not be enough, right? But I just wanted to make this little joke that Lacan uses, it yeah. insists. It's funny you bring that up because uh, I know a lot of analytic philosophers that have mocked that phrase as if it's just, you know, one of those characteristically pseudo-profound statements that continental philosophers make. Um, yeah, yeah, it's really a joke, right? I mean, yeah. Without, yeah, I mean, it's clearly, I mean, well, I, I think there's a serious point behind the joke, but yeah, it is, um, yeah, it, I, 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 the point I understand behind it, the serious point is the one I made before about, you know, how like etymologically to exist means to, to stand out, to stand outside as, you know, being, among other beings. Um, and then if you want to say that God insists etymologically is, is kind of, yeah, to emphasize it, the, um, the standing within, you know, aspect of, of, of God's um, being or whatever. Which I think comports better with like Plotinus's. Um, so Plotinus, he often uses this phrase to describe the um, to refer to the one as um, uh, the power of all things. So he actually, in a sense, inverts um, the Aristotelian emphasis on um, you know um, energia in Greek or um, activity, uh, act, you know, actus in Latin, or whatever, and and. and in a sense, emphasizes potentiality um, as, you know, um, God is the, the potentiality or the power of all things. And I think, yeah, so that's a good point to make. 
because because you can yeah um le- legitimately view god from either perspective um it doesn't have to be a just a pure act which which can tend to um lead to like this dominating image of like usually a masculine deity um you know at, you know uh, who's subject passive subject you know <laughs> Um, underneath so yeah it, it yeah it, all this which is just to say that um our wait. imagery of god is important yeah wait didn't dionysus the area of page eight said something about god being the exemplar of material causes like all four causes find their exemplar in god like the material cause when you're talking about pure power potentiality that's the material co- well, that could be seen as a material cause in a certain sense. Does that make sense or no? <laughs> uh, not sure what you're quite asking, but Dionysius doesn't really think in terms of Aristotelian causality for the most part. He's he's a inheritor of Proclus, you know, yeah. a bit after. Who's a bit after the times, but yeah. I don't know. It might be my translation of him that's... Yep. Oh. What I, I would think I would think that you can integrate Aristotelian causality within a generally Platonic framework, right? I mean Yes. Pure power. Yeah. So you've got me thinking about the way that that um because in, in that right kind of conception, right? There's the scale of being or sort of the so God has to be both you know, or, or existence itself, or, you know, kind of the, has, has to be both kind of the top of the scale of being, but also has to be in some way beyond the scale, right? We have to safeguard, it's, it's not just, you know, he's up there, but if he's, he's in some, he's, you know, that kind of omnipresence to the entire, um, the entire scale of being, kind of that, that by which any of it, of it is at all, Um, right? So, so, I, I guess you would say God doesn't exist. God is that by which anything at all exists, right? And so can't God can't be found, right, as an existent, right? But only as uh, existence disclosing itself as such and such a, a particular form. Um, but but not not in it like it contains. You know, we can't encompass God, but God can show Himself through that that form. Um, they, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Because I'm just going to qualify that. Yeah, even though it's the case that God is not cannot be found as an existent, it's necessarily the case that God condescends as an existent. You know, reveals Himself as an existent to us because we we can't know anything that is not a finite existent. You know, that's just that's how we are. We, you know, so. Um, the other point I was just going to make, um, which I was reminded to make after your last one, Glenn, um, just hits on, I think, his, his slight caricature of Neoplatonism with a um, not a very good understanding of Plotinus. <laughs> or, or at least um, he's using uh, like a, a very crude understanding of Plotinus and representing that as if it's Neoplatonism and ignoring like Proclus you know, who influenced Dionysius, who obviously in, in turn influences Thomas, you know. Um, and um, well, one thing that uh, I think he doesn't quite represent quite well in early Neoplatonism is this idea of the hierarchy of being. So he, he seems to think that, you know, um, higher beings, so like, um, so those above, you know, soul, like loose or whatever, um, or let's say Proclus's henads or whatever, that they have a higher participation in the one or, or God, you know, than those who are lower. But this is a complete mess up. Like this is a very common understanding of, um, but it's a complete misunderstanding of um, the hierarchy of being, which you see in um, neo- Neoplatonism. It, um, uh, Eric Pearl, he, he, his Dionysius called Theophany, he, he 
provides a really good critique of this in uh, there's a chapter called the hierarchy of being and he says um that you know you have to say at one and the same time that um there's an immediate um between the good and the one and um all the hierarchies of being there's um an immediate presence between between um you know the between the two but also that there's a um immediacy at the same time you know so, so that you can say for example that uh that higher beings like angels perhaps are closer to god and more divine um insofar as they participate more in the good and receive more greater gifts from the good you know because they are higher in this the scale of, of being whatever but that doesn't mean that they just because they have a higher in a, in a manner of speaking a higher share of participation that, that doesn't mean that they um that those lower on the scale have less of um uh that the the presence is more um mediate it's not as immediate that that's a misunderstanding it's um yeah so that's just one thing i just would want to clarify and i think should we picture it as the one as being the radius in an infinite circle, I guess, because the radius is equidistant from all the points around the circle, if that makes sense. Let all those points around the radius represent all, I guess, all beings. And basically, you could say that, oh, wait, is it the radius or is it the center? that center point on the circle, what is it called? Uh, the center. Okay, the center. <laughs> Basically, the one is like the center of a circle. He's equidistant or immediately present to all beings yeah. that are the points around it. Just in a different mode. Yeah, that's, there's, a, there's a key um, scholastic maxim which comes from Plotinus originally, which is that, um, yeah, or each being participates in being or good, the one according to a, a, a distinct mode. Um, yes, but it's, it's like a cup, like, yeah. well, it's like containers, different size containers containing, containing yes. water, containing water from the ocean or something like that. The forms would right. be analogous to the different size container. Each form is its own different container and the transcendentals would go into the container and they can only carry so much as, as the container allows. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, I mean, to just give like a, a concrete example from like Pseudo Dionysius himself, like his, for his layers of, also his levels of being or whatever. So he has, um, he's, is that all things participate in God as goodness and being, right? That's the um, the universal um, participation. And then um, living things participate in God as goodness, being, and life. So life is a kind of name of God, which yes. living beings participate in, right? So that's the um, how certain mode of uh, being participates according to that distinct mode. And then once you get to the cognitive level, um, cognitive things, they participate as goodness, being, life, and wisdom. So you have uh, wisdom for um, Dionysius is the Christian, Christianized version of nous. So, you know, for, for Plotinus, nous is, is intellect usually. And then uh, but for, for the Christian Neoplatonist, um, Dionysius, um, Sophia, or wisdom, is the, the, the name of God, which is used to represent cognitive um, uh, to, to show what cognitive beings participate in, right? So, yeah, so there's ultimately different levels of being. You have um, uh, you know, being um, goodness, life, and then intellect. Um, Wait. And then obviously below, you have non um, cognitive beings, below that material beings, right? Wait, doesn't that remind you of the following? Okay, if they participate in only being let that be one point on a circle. Obviously, yeah. it doesn't form a shape with the cent 
it doesn't form a shape. Now let's suppose like goodness being in life, let those be three points on the circumference of a circle. What shape would they, if the circle was God, what would those three points make as a shape? A triangle. Then if there are four, if there are four points or four, four perfections that are participated in, it would be a square inscribed in a circle. Sure. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's certainly one way of trying to visually represent mathematically the now when we various when, participation. Yeah. But when, when we get to that, there's this classic um I, I often see it attributed to uh Nicholas of Cusa, which you know, he certainly does use it prominently, but it, it predates him. There's this book called The Book of the 24 Philosophers. Yes. I don't actually know who first said this, but that God is an infinite, and you can say circle or also, you know, a sphere, yeah. right? Whose yeah. center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. So kind of you what what does it do to our image when we take away kind of the the circumference? Right? It it kind of it's limitless. No, no boundary, nothing. It's everywhere and, and nowhere at the same time. And so, and so it, 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 it kind of shows the limit of just because, because then we're, we're no longer able to conceptualize any shape, right? If, if we take it away, then it, it's, it's transcended our capacity to, to image it is, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, which, tells us something about, about God's uh, uh, ineffability, right? E even when we have this very good, you know, the best image, the best icon of God that we can, uh, but he is beyond uh, even that. And then in that ungraspability, in that failure to represent God, we, we know God in, 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 in that, that- In right, a negative it, sense. Like we, 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 we see, we experientially that what we can't encompass him, but then we we're showing it we're, it's disclosed to us, right. That, that rather if, if, if even a spatial metaphor is to be used, he encompasses us. Um, uh, but infinitely. So not as a, not as a container. Oh, uh, that reminds me. Sorry, this is a little off topic, but I was just thinking of this with, with regards to spatial metaphors and shapes and math metaphors. Sure. Imagine that there are infinitely many parallel lines. How would you imagine it as one line succeeding another? Like, you know, like there's this line here, this line here, this line here. Oh, wait, let me show you my, like this line here this line here, this line here, would you imagine it linearly or as arranged in a circle? I'm, I'm just thinking of like three-dimensional space with like, is all, I'm almost thinking of like. Like basically it's linear. Just, like you imagine all these parallel lines, one succeeding the other. But why not imagine them as arranged in a circle? And what I mean is each parallel line is equidistant from the other parallel line or some, oh, oh. I don't know, Never mind. I mean, one thing that can be uh, helpful is um, if you think just as a, as a sphere of influence, right? If you're, very, so if you're a very, very strong person, you can influence a lot of, of people it's almost yeah. like you're gonna resonate, but if you grow too fast, like say you're a firm and you touch a lot of clients and then you touch too much client, too many clients too quickly, right? Then uh -huh. your sphere will wobble and will collapse, right? So oh you can imagine God. how how strong your center needs to be in order to reach out to infinity, right? So you, yeah. you kind of like take the analogy and take the limit to infinity of this analogy to kind of get an inkling or get like, um, a kind of uh, the gist of what God would be, right? How yeah. strong, how strong its center would be in order to be able to um, influence everything or to kind of like penetrate everything or something. 
So it's just it's just a metaphor, really, right? And to, to taking it to the limit to kind of like to, to 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 get the idea of it, because everything otherwise limited has a boundary, and the limit of this boundary depends on the strength of its center, in a way, right? If that By makes the way, sense. Have you read? <sighs> no, it just reminds me of something. Has anyone here read War and Peace? That part where where oh what's his name oh poo pierre bezukov it's like he's dead or something or nearly dead and he has this dream or vision of this old priest of this old teacher of his and this teacher of his was holding a globe and that globe represented god and everything that's in the globe that are trying to encompass the globe. That's all creation or all people or something like that. They're trying to encompass the globe or trying to fill it, but they can't and they're beaten back down. Does anyone remember that or no? I haven't, you know, you're making me want to read Warren. Oh, oh you're almost making me want to read Warren, please. Is there a link with the, the with the Freemasonry of uh, Pierre, or is this like not? No, linked? it's when no? it's no, it's not Freemasonry. It has to do with when the peasant he likes, uh, the peasant Katiev dies. He sort of has this vision or something. I don't know what. Anyway, that that <laughs> that that is intriguing, but. Uh... Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, hats off to people who who have read War and Peace. But but um, gosh, my my uh, you know, my my queue of things to read is just already. I, I need a couple of lifetimes, you know, to to get through that. Um, wait, so but just to kind of make sure that we touch. So so as uh, Samuel said, right? Like um, this may be kind of a caricature or kind of a or you know like a uh. Uh, yeah, or a portrayal of the Neoplatonic conception that doesn't do full justice to it, right? But uh, because Clark sees Aquinas as, uh, you know, overcoming a key weakness in Neoplatonic participation. Now, so somebody like uh, Pearl would probably say, actually, they already did, did that. <laughs> and then Aquinas just picked up what Neoplatonists already did to calibrate their own system, right? Uh, but but what 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 th this adjustment right is is um, I mean we can think of this as like an intra Neoplatonic clarification of what would otherwise be an inadequate um, understanding of participation. So right, ultimate it's so we like you can think of a layering of many participated higher forms right, uh, and each of these is more universal than the others. So like the these forms is, is like one on top of each other uh but without like the russian clear... nesting dolls those I, russian I guess, nesting dolls i guess so i think that's 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 a good uh, image for that i think uh but but uh without any clear principle of unity binding them all into the unity of a single being uh, since since all of the forms were like acts in themselves um uh Right, but then in Aristotelian act potency, uh, any one such compos in any one such composition, there can only be one dominant act at one time. So every other component must be subordinate as potency to act. Um, and Thomas says, out of two entities in an act, it is impossible to make an intrinsic unity, an unum per, per se. One has to be act, the other potency. So, so then, um, you know, as Clark puts it, right, uh, from Neoplatonism, Thomas gets the basic structure of participation and pours into it what he calls the new wine of, you know, the doctrine of the act of existence as the core of all perfection, diversely participated by limiting essence, form and matter, right? And then uh, Thomas transposes the whole into the Aristotelian relationship of potency to act uh, to ensure the intrinsic unity of all three resulting compositions, existence, essence, form, matter, accident, substance, needed to render intelligible all the ways that reality manifests itself as both one and many. 
so in this synthesis, right, the whole interlocking system of metaphysical compositions on different levels within a single real being can be summarized, right, in this way. All express relationships of act to potency. Um, so he has this little diagram at the bottom of 158, uh, which if you can see uh, kind of showing how they all uh, fit together. Um, and when you look at that, I mean, how, how does that sit with you? I mean, was, was, did, you, did you find that fairly clear when he kind of shows how you've got com, com, a complete real being and then, right, accidents, existing substance, right? And then it looks like within, uh, within existing substance, you have existence and essence. And then within essence, you have form and matter. Right, and then for, within form, and then he kind of subsumes it all under act and potency. Yeah, that, um, that part was probably the most confusing for me is what that uh, act and potency right bracket is supposed to include. Is it everything to the right of the first equal sign? So it's like complete real being equals big bracket, which <laughs> equals act and potency. It looks like he, because it looks like he wanted to stretch it like, like, like it's supposed to be just all, everything to the left of that big old bracket is under, subsumed under act and potency. Um, oh. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. So like the bracket with accidents and existing substance all the way to the right just before act and potency, that's supposed to be is that right? Or, or is it supposed to be literally everything from the, the left of the equal sign with act and potency? Uh, just everything, including complete being. I, I felt that was a little ambiguous from at least how it's like typeset. I mean, it might yeah. be clear in his, in his head uh, what he intended. I, I, uh, I mean, it could be both, but according to the way his chapter the section of this chapter structured, I think it's probably just um, with regard to the compositions, because this, this, this section is titled um, Synthesis of All the Compositions Under Act and Potency. Um, good, good. That's that's actually, that's really informative. Yeah. yeah. I did think this was a good summary, though, right? If you're, if you're thinking of accidents and then you separate it out uh, with existing substance, in terms of uh, essence and existence. I, I just, I think this is just a, if, if we could improve on the diagram, I don't know how we would, but it, it does kind of like summarize a lot of different things at once. Right, and then, and then we've got the, um... The glossary of key terms, you know, which um, yeah, we went over some of those, and um, but it's handy to have it there. Um, yeah, I was I was very interested in something that Samuel said before, kind of about this possibility of conceiving of God or the One as, you know, um, sort of all all potentiality as opposed to to pure pure act. Um, could could you could you say say a bit more about that? And like because because it it makes sense that you could you could do it that way rather than than this way. Yeah, well, I mean, it it just depends whether you view um, the infinite or totopedon in in Greek as chaotic indeterminacy or the um, the fullness of, let me, you can view indeterminacy conversely as um, infinite possibility, which is, you know, um, more of a creative, uh, you know, image, uh, productive of infinite, diff infinite variations of, of being, right? Yeah, so it just depends. Um, and, and I think for, for, I think that's why Plotinus uses the language of, um, you know, the one is dunamis ton ton ton, 
the power of all things because dunamis um, for him um, it doesn't uh, have a chaotic quality to to the word, um, but it's dynamic. I mean, that's what literally what it means. You know, uh, there's a dynamism to to it. So, whereas for um, at least a superficial reading of Aquinas, who inherits Aristotle, seems to suggest that um, it's infinitely fecund. That um, yeah, that indeterminacy or the infinite um, is is kind of a chaotic concept, but um, and, and that's why you need like God as you know. Um, uh, actus ascendi, the you know the act of uh, being, um, the act of all acts, that sort of thing. Because potency is a, a, a receptive, passive notion, as opposed to a um, active um, notion. So. But it's, it's definitely the case, it seems right, that, that Aquinas has, not nevertheless, right, in, insofar as he's taken on board, um, you know, the, the perfect is the infinite, right, is, is the, uh, is the um, all right, thanks for joining us, Lorenzo, see you, uh, see you next time, I hope, glad you could join us. But be right, and 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 you were saying that that um, the, these can just be um, complementary ways of conceiving of of divine infinitude. Yeah, I mean, it's just you know those dualities in our experience, like active, passive, um, et cetera, you know, the, which you, if you emphasize one of them, I think you can, you can just lead to a, an image of God, which is just, um, it, it, how do I put it? You're, you're idolizing, um, you know, one pole of being when, when you should be, Thinking of God as the co you know, to use language of Cusa, coincidentia positorum, coincidence of opposites is not just um, dominantly one, like activity, pure activity, and then or passivity is, is um, both and or um, neither. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, and that's where where people like um, like Cusa have pressed into a post Aristotelian. Uh, paradigm i guess you know they've they've, they've kind of um you know I, th I think i think uh a classical thomist would be very loath to accept kind of this you know because because it 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 precisely transgresses the principle of non-contradiction um well i mean you can uphold it like in the order of of limited beings but 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 in god it it it, it doesn't it doesn't hold that you know which intuitively makes sense to me that 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 he has to encompass uh you know he has to be both you know the maximum and the minimum and kind of you know uh you know and any other he, he he's he's always precisely that that um that coincidence it, like it, it 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 i think works very well um in that way but 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 probably um The only thing with that, um, sorry uh, to, to interject, but um, I don't know, am I cutting you off? Did you want to complete that thought? Uh, did you have something more to say, Brian? No, you can, um, you can uh, what, what, were you what were you thinking? Well, I mean, I, I tend to agree that uh, um, in some sense, God would, be, would have to be, um, would have to reconcile himself 
all opposites, right? Because if he's um, actus purus, you know, pure actuality, then that and doesn't have any potential, then he is, in some sense, all things, including opposite things or contradictory things, right? Um, however, you know, sort of rebarkative that is to reason when I mean, we think about ordinary things, you know, but of God, the infinite, that has to be some, that has to be the, the terminus in some sense. The only problem with that is that would have to include um, things we normally think um, can't possibly um, be ascribed to God, like, you know, so God, good and evil would be opposites. So do we say that God is evil as well as good and so on and so forth. And, and of course, in a, in a, in a platonic um, scheme, those things don't exist. <laughs> the evil and ugliness and, and so on are just deficiencies. And in some sense, they don't really exist. Um, I don't know how, how if, if they do or don't in, in Aristotle's scheme. But so that's a little bit problematic. I mean, the whole idea of pure actuality is, is very interesting. And it's very, it's a very arresting idea. I can imagine how lots of people would object that how, you know, how can, is that even possible? Like, is pure actuality any more uh, thinkable than pure potentiality? We, we, I mean, everyone, we all say, that, we all agree, I suppose, that pure potentiality doesn't exist, right? Because it's pure potential. There's no actuality, so it doesn't exist. Um, but what about pure actuality? Uh, I do, yeah, it's it's. I don't have any clear thoughts or ideas about this, but it's an interesting question. Um, well, the um, process philosophers or process theologians like Whitehead would probably say that God has pure actuality and pure potential potentiality. That God is evolving along as we evolve because we are. We co inhere in God. So as we evolve, God evolves also, since God is essentially us and more than us. Yeah, that's really interesting, um, Ted. And I, I guess that goes back to what um, Samuel was suggesting that you can think of God as potentiality or pure potentiality as well as pure. Uh, being or pure actuality that's, that's, that's very interesting uh, and in in the chapter I mean in St Thomas um, as far as I can tell in in, in Norris um, Clark he doesn't think of I mean for, for him right unless I'm misunderstanding pure potentiality is nothing at all and, and is not identified in any sense with God in the in the Thomistic scheme it's that's not in Neoplatonism and other things, perhaps in process philosophy, perhaps, but not not as far as I can tell in in Thomism. Um, and so, just to just to, if I could just uh, rewind a little bit, um, because pure poten potentiality. This also is related to um, what uh, Jonathan was saying, because I thought I thought that was very um, interesting and uh, illuminating. Uh, input there because uh, this doesn't come through so clearly in uh, in Norris Clark, but it seems um, in another account that I read about pure ma uh, prime matter, prime matter is pure potentiality, which means prime matter doesn't actually exist in any sense except pure, um, conceptually. So it doesn't. He doesn't. Whereas Norris Clark talks about this in terms of uh, he calls it the non-formal principle of quantitative spatial extension that functions as potency, as potency, and it just doesn't. I don't know. It just uh, maybe the the two things mean the same thing. But so um, I've got a quote here, which might throw some light on on, or at least offer a different, uh, or somewhat different, um, take on what prime matter is supposed to be. And this is rather like what uh, Jonathan was saying. So it says. Um, it says here this quote, and it's from Fez's book on Aquinas, and it says, to be sure, um, so the quote, um, to be sure Aquinas, um, so I'll just turn that on, 
Yeah, so, so to be sure, Aquinas tells us that uh, what is in potency to exist substantially is called prime matter, or in other words, that we can distinguish between, between matter having no form whatsoever, prime matter, and the various substantial forms that it has the potential to take on. But this distinction is for him a purely conceptual one. In reality, however, however matter uh, may be transformed, it will always have some substantial form or other, and thus count as a substance of some kind or other. Strictly speaking, he says, um, since all cognition and every definition are uh, through form, it follows that prime matter can be known or, or defined, not of itself, but through composite. Uh, yeah, so yeah, there is not, no such thing as prime matter. It's not like some stuff that's spread out through space and time. It's a, it's a purely conceptual terminus when we think about potentiality. It's, you know, pure potentiality. That's what prime matter is, apparently, according to this other uh, exposition. It's just that I think you have to think about it as a way of thinking about matter and potentiality in general. It's like the the point. It's the horizon. It, it's not. It's not that it's. But it's conceptual. I think that's a, that was the point of. I think that quote, um, rather than anything that's. I don't know. I didn't didn't seem to chime so well with what I read in the chapter. Well, and it, you know, it makes me think of, you know, since there is no, um, uh, oh, Naeem, if, if you just like, when, if, let's, if you just mute yourself when you're not talking, just so that there's not an echo. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> That's fine. Um, yeah, so how, how different is the Thomistic conception of matter from the uh, Platonic one, which was used as its foil, you know? I think, I think again, it's, it's a little, because, uh, I, I mean, you know. What, what is, the, again, I, mean, I don't know what the uh, Platonic conception of matter is, actually, so because Norris Clark says Platonism is antimatter anyway, right? So. Um, do we need uh, matter in, in Platonism? I'm not sure. Um, there are forms, certainly, and they're not somehow they're different, right? The, the platonic forms aren't quite the same thing as uh, um, Aristotle's forms. But, yeah, I don't know. Someone can um, educate me on this. Um, what's, how does matter work in Plato? I don't, I'm not aware that he, it's, it's, it's an important category or thing. I think it's it's it, it the, the accounts I've seen of of it you know it is precisely that that same thing where you know we we um, we we can't even conceive of uh, a pure matter be, because it would be just that pure uh, receptivity to form uh, you know um, so I, I, it it seems basically to, to me it seems like it's basically the same. The same conception of matter, I, I, except that that we're not you know we're not saying that matter is evil. Um, uh, but but then again, I mean, neither do post-Platinian Neoplatonists say that matter is evil. So, uh, you know, we 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 could say that maybe Aquinas is concurs with the post-Platinist Neoplatonists. In that way, I mean, it, you know, I think I think he is basically the same conception of prima materia, um, and so so it, then so matter, right? It, it's not uh, it's it's it just is that con concept uh, concept that enables us to account for uh, as we said, it's 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 like that. You know how how is there a diversity of 
of of beings you know i guess instances of that that share in the same form but then along the horizontal plane there's sort of there's a multiplicity of them and and, and it is matter that that um that accounts for that um so that's that's the work it's doing and also i think as, as we said right it's sort of it, it becomes when 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 one thing becomes another thing it's it's the matter that sort of is the principle of of continuity even as the um as as the essence of the thing has has shifted into a different uh, different essence um that's another thing that um he he mentioned in the text that i i felt like was like implicit in what i was presenting last week when I gave the diagrams where it goes from like one substance to another, there's like this intermediary step of like undifferentiated matter. Um, that when we're talking about um, matter being kind of like the thing underneath which remains the same in substantial change, uh, he, he talks about it as like the one many relation is reversed. This is the top of 155. I, I don't think I, I put it in those terms, but I think it clarifies some of what's going on. Like if I say one substance turns into two substances, say an amoeba, you've got a hunk of matter organized by just one cell and it divides. Well, the stuff underneath is the matter. Um, and that's what stays the same, even though substantially what's changed is now there's two amoeba. Uh, I, I feel like that that was just like a little bit illuminating in a way that uh, I, I just did, I didn't articulate it that way. I haven't heard somebody articulate it precisely that way of like the one many relation being reversed. Um, and I, I think that's weird, but I, I feel like there's something appealing about it uh, to, to be able to frame it that way. So I was just, I'm just wondering whether um, in, in thinking about um, matter and potentiality, I just wonder if you d you need two concepts or two, two things. They seem to sort of um, merge in some sense. I mean, of course, when we think about matter ordinarily and we think of stuff, right, but um, but I just want I mean, stuff that's sort of in some sense, you know, that you can is is concrete or whatever. But I, I just don't I don't know if that's re, it's really necessary to think of matter as something separate or different. I can't tell the difference really when I think about matter, and that just that could be just because I'm confused. <laughs> but I can't tell the difference between matter and potentiality. Um, so why do you need some underlying um, stuff? I don't, I don't know why that's the case. Um, so if, if the amoeba uh, maybe this is a separate point, if the amoeba uh, splits up, so then you have um, a different form or, you know, two forms rather than one, perhaps, I don't know. So why does there have to be a principle of continuity? Uh, I mean, this is, I'm, I'm getting off the point. This is a di different question, but that's also something that I'm not too sure about. Um, yeah, I mean, th this is like a, it's, it's quite intuitive and common sense to always assume that there's some underlying stuff, right? Which undergoes change or whatever. But like, I always feel like that's just like a metaphysical assumption or, or, or presupposition that's just sort of seems redundant to me um uh. well suppose it were otherwise suppose we were to say you've got amoeba and uh you've got two substances um like what is the form joined to if you say it's not joined to something uh i'm sorry that you've got uh two instances of the form uh if they're still organizing the same matter, uh, then we have kind of like two objects taking up the same space and and such. That sounds weird. Um, like 
kind of like overlapping beings or something. Um, but if we if we say that we don't need to have this form united to some matter, then we've just gotten rid of homeomorphism entirely as well. So, uh, like, is there another way to go about that, like, to avoid either of those implications? I mean, I don't. I'm happy to dispense with homeomorphism because, to me, to me, it just raises more. Uh, questions than it answers, but because of um, because of matter, but I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't really, um, yeah, I don't know the answer. Um, yeah, so that so that that could be like a, kind of like what should a hylomorphist say, basically? Yeah. Um, so like from within the hylomorphic the, system, is are these the only oh, two options? Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, no, I, that's I don't. That's a good question. Um, yeah, I don't know. But um, instead of trying to save hylomorphism, or trying to patch it up, um, if I could sort of maybe um, try to undermine it a bit more. <laughs> so um, I another thing I think about is um, I I just wonder if the whole idea or theory of um, any underlying substance is, I feel like it's it's the way we talk about things and it, so it becomes plausible because of the way we talk about things. But I wonder if that's just because our language, I mean, our language is limited, right? And words, we have a certain number of words we can use. Our, our language can't be like, indefinitely nuanced and cover all shades of reality so it may be perhaps it's just that we language can't track all the different changes in 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 reality so we say that something or a substance remains a substance in spite of accidental properties that come and go like like position or whatever so we say it's the same thing so there's an underlying thing that could just be the way we talk about them. That, that just could just be the way we talk about reality, right? Because language is limited. So I, I don't know. This is just I don't necessarily think this or believe this, but it's just purely speculative. But but yeah, it's that's another worry for me that I think um, I think uh, maybe it's just a reflection of of how limited. Uh, languages and we talk about substances because how else are we going to talk about I mean every time I move from so I'm in London now and if I go over to the United States um, people are going to still refer to me by my name right the same name I'm not going to change my name suddenly every time an accidental property that I have it goes away and I have another accidental property because that's impossible because then I would have an infinite number of names <laughs> to refer to me, right? So that's anything, things, everything is like that. So we can't have an infinite number of um, substantives for substances because that's, we, we can't uh, meaningfully talk about the world that way or, or, or um, practically talk about the world that way. So, so yeah, does that make any sense? To, I don't know. Mm. That that's very. Uh, I mean, that's very very. Um, just just uh, skeptical. I know, but <laughs> well, it doesn't have to be skeptical. I mean, it it could just be a reflection on how uh, common sense type stuff is very pragmatic, oftentimes. And the way that we talk and the way that we operate in the world, the way that we take things to be and how they match language, you know, just pretty theoretically. Um, yeah. It, it just, it, if we're going to try to justify common sense type of ways of thinking, uh, if we're going to try to justify like the normal practices that we have, then um, like what would be the best kind of system? And you could just then say, well, we could just be anti-realists about a lot of these different things 
and just realize that we're fine just operating on some fictions here or something like that or, or our society runs on fictions and it works good enough uh so if we're going to try to give like a good metaphysical analysis that commits us to real things it's going to commit us to weird things uh that mm -hmm. maybe is unappealing theoretically i mean that's i understand that position mm -hmm. and the appeal to it um but if we're trying to like justify common sense situations which physicists don't necessarily think is important uh then like uh how are we going to go about it? I mean, if, if, yeah. if the way people like folk etymology, not, I'm sorry, etymology, if folk concepts just need to be discarded because theoretically they're untenable, then maybe we need to do the same kind of thing with other like views that try to justify it. Like if Thomism fits really well with common sense, but common sense is not real. Okay. Then Thomism isn't real. And, and uh, you notice how often Clark, uh, Right, refers to, you know, he says, you know, refers to our experience, in our experience, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, in a sense, like, like, so what if at the level of physics, we say oh, none of, our, we live in our experience, right? And so, so as far as we're concerned, um, you know, this, this does seem, this does seem to correspond to what we actually encounter. Um, Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I, th I think um, at some level you have to take uh, language at face value, right? And so, and you have, if you have to choose between, you know, either saying um, probably are um, any kind of true metaphysics reflects. Um, how we or, or or our language reflects that kind of meta uh, metaphysics either that or there's no relation at all and uh, it's metaphysics is impossible because you know then then you have to you have to sort of go with you can't we can't help how we use language right and we i think there's something very commonsensical and and sensible about um, aristotle's uh, and Thomas uh, sort of metaphysics in, in, in thinking about, you know, substances and, and objects in the world and things and undergoing change. It's, it's very, um, it's, it is kind of like a very sophisticated version of how we talk about things, you know, ordinarily and how we kind of assume things are. Um, so I, I think there's a lot to be said for that. And that's actually a, something that recommends it, um, you know, the fact that you don't have to um, completely rethink language and the relationship between language and the world as being, you know, possibly completely unrelated or whatever. I mean, that's possible, but why, why go there? So what we're actually exploring then is sort of, I mean, you, it, 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 you could say it's, it's also the structures of intelligibility and of our um, and for us, what 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 is real is what is intelligible, right? Right. Yeah, that's a good. That's a very good point, actually. Yeah. No, that's that's um, language and intelligibility. Exactly. I mean, and that's that's quite uh, platonic as well, isn't it? Right. It, reality is. Uh, yes, we have to sort of assume that. Um, uh, that's very important part of what we mean when we, whenever we say we're talking about what what is real that it has to be intelligible. Yeah. Um, I I like that view, but I don't know why we would have to hold that view, right? I mean, it could just be that reality is unintelligible uh, and final analysis, and that we make things or we there are. There is an ex so some extent reality is intelligible, but fundamentally or ultimately it's not. I mean that that seems like a very plausible view, even if I disagree with it, right? Like if somebody were to say, well, quantum mechanics implies you know fundamental random statistical regularities or something like that. To me, that just sounds unintelligible. Uh, and 
for it to somehow play out that as things get more complicated as far as like you get to bigger and bigger orders of stuff um it's more regular i'm going to be just like that still sounds pretty unintelligible if at the basics it's just random i, I don't understand that um but like uh, I'm, I'm willing to kind of like say, don't understand yet. And that's my view. But like, if somebody told me it is actually unintelligible at the fundamentals, uh, I'm going to be like, okay, I see why someone would think that. Um, and to say like, you know, our, our size uh, of the universe, like trees, canned goods, things like that, uh, the ordinary objects, like things are intelligible. Like, yeah, I, I mean, I, I understand why someone would think that it's intelligible at that level, but uh, I, it, it feels like there's a disconnect here. I understand why someone doesn't think there's a disconnect, but I think that they're just because it's, they're anti-realists and they're gonna just be like, well, it's intelligible because we're imposing intelligibility on it. And I'm gonna be like, oh, well, then it's just not, actually uh, intelligible but that's just a mere disagreement that's rational right it's it's not like a um it's not like i i i think there's no defense for their view right yeah I, for me i um so i i guess for me what the reason I think of uh, reality as being almost kind of synonymous with intelligible is because um, I think basically it's because um, um, because I, I don't think um, you can think of uh, otherwise you have to say you know uh, we we exist as uh, thinking you know uh, human beings uh, who have ideas and thoughts about the world and we're somehow completely disconnected from the world and and you have to posit a completely sort of external world to the to the mind and uh, or to the intellect and I just find that because I have a sort of a bias toward uh, I think a, a kind of a quasi idealist position so I mean I don't think there's anything apart from thinking or intellecting so uh, yeah so uh, um i don't know if that's very clear but um yeah because otherwise you have a completely sort of like what seems like a arbitrary metaphysical picture where you know we're just human beings and we have um thoughts about the world but they're completely perhaps the world is completely un. it's a very materialist picture as well that that is completely um unrelated possibly or you know or perhaps there's a relationship but i think that's more of a of a metaphysical kind of um uh a huge metaphysical assumption to make and i don't know if it's meaningful even to talk about anything apart from like being an object of experience and um thought and thinking basically so yeah Yeah, take care, Yusin. Thanks for joining us. Glad you could make it. I think I agree with the essence of what you're trying to say, Liam, but I, I just wouldn't articulate it in terms of being in um, mind or thought being synonymous. So I would say that. Um, to be is to be intelligible. I mean, this is the fundamental maxim of Neoplatonic thought, which is because all the way back to Parmenides. Um, and therefore, there's no such thing as an unintell unintelligible being, a being that cannot be thought. For to do so would already be to think such a being. I mean, this is just, you know, logically the case. So, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I, I just, my worry is just with languages, is always is um how do we articulate this insight of to be is to be intelligible in a way that is intelligible <laughs> to um people you know uh, because i often find that 
yeah um it's particularly if, if you're like a, a, a realist was often called a realist or like some like a Thomas, for instance it's it seems um unintelligible the, the, the idea of what they think is idealism um but i, I think that's only because they um They are kind of externalizing being and being and thought as as if they're two separate principles rather than being you know co-constitutive principles, which is how you should view both being and being an intellect. You know, they they are dis, um, distinct in our minds as principles, but they are ultimately inseparable um in reality and yeah i don't know it's just difficult to make that insight intelligible to um a, an age which tends to externalize things like i find our, our modern age tends to so often objectify and externalize um that which you know should be well not should be how to put this um you you ha everything has to be subjective sub i don't know how to put this subjective and internal first like that's that's what i'm trying to say you you can't understand an object as a voice from a subject. You can't understand an external thing which is not first internalized. I mean, this is just that was taught, just obvious and talked about it a little bit. Yeah, it's it's just so often like forgotten by a lot of people I find. So So did we want to end the recording? <laughs> There's nothing else that we wanted to say. So. Yeah, and you know we can uh, feel free to hang around a bit and just chat about anything at all if you'd like. But yeah, I'll, I'll uh, go ahead and wrap up the formal uh, part of the evening. So uh, thanks for the great discussion, everybody. Um, this has been uh, <clears throat> Norris Clark's uh, The One and the Many, Chapter 10. The metaphysical structures of finite being and interlocking synthesis. And uh, next time uh, we'll talk about uh, chapter 11, being in time. What is time? And uh, that's, that's, you can tell I'm, I'm excited about that. So I'm looking forward to talking about, about time. And uh, I'll see you uh, next time, I hope. And uh, uh, for now, take care.